The title of today's message is The Life of Jacob. Okay, The Life of Jacob. So we have learned a lot about Jacob, so we probably know many of the things that we will talk about today. However, when we put all of these things together, uh, we could see that the life of Jacob is very important, especially for us who are living a life of faith in these end times. So in today's text, it talks about Jacob's birth. As we know, he was one of the twins, right? His older brother was Esau, and Jacob was the younger brother. Jacob is one of those people who really had a hard life. Um, he suffered a lot. He's one of those figures in the Bible that has had much hardships in his life. And as we saw in today's text, he was born struggling and fighting. He wanted to come out first, right? He wanted that firstborn blessings, but he didn't get it. Esau came out first, and he came out holding on to Esau's heel, so they named him Jacob. The name Jacob literally means supplanter or one who grabs by the heel. Okay, That's the literal meaning of his name, the one who grabs by the heel. So if you think about that name, one who grabs by the heel, what, is, what do you think that means? Do you think that's a positive name or a negative name? It's, it's not a positive name, right? Imagine if you're walking and somebody grabs you by the heel. It'll trip you, right? It'll make you fall. And then the implied meaning behind that is supplanter. What is a supplanter? That's somebody who deceives or tricks to take the place of someone else. That describes exactly Jacob's life, right? He tricked his brother to go in the place of his older brother to receive the firstborn blessings. So that's Jacob's life. So how does that relate to us today? We are, after the fall of Adam, we are all sinners. We are all born not as the firstborn, okay? We're all born as sinners. However, those of us who are here at church, we are here because we desire the firstborn blessings like Jacob did. So Jacob's life teaches us that as fallen human beings, after we're born into this world, we also have to struggle and fight for those spiritual firstborn rights and blessings, just as Jacob did. Moreover, we could also look at it from a different perspective, like Rebecca, she had twins in her and they were fighting. She didn't know what was going on. So she asked God, why am I this way? That, I believe, is a question that all sinners who desire to be righteous should be asking. Like Rebecca, we should be asking, why am, I, why am I like this? Why is there a struggle in me? Why can I be good as God desires for us to be? And God answered her by saying, it's because there are two peoples in you. And the conclusion was, the younger or the older will serve the younger, right? So what does that mean? There's two people in us, in all of us. We all have twins in us. Esau and Jacob are in us right now. Esau is the, the fleshly person, but he's the firstborn. And Jacob is the spiritual person. He's the younger. But it, it is God's promise that the older the fleshly will serve the younger. That's how God had originally intended. When God created human beings before the fall of man, uh, before the fall of Adam, the spirit of God that is in us is to rule over the flesh so that we walk according to God's desires, right? But after the fall, that got turned upside down. That's why Esau was the firstborn. He represents the fleshly person. Right? So Jacob's life and all of his struggles have very important relevance to us today. So Jacob's life can be divided into seven stages, and he moved through 17 different places. Okay, seven stages and 17 places. Both of these numbers are very meaningful in the Bible, right? Seven is the number of perfection. 17 is 10 plus 7. 7 being perfection and 10 being completion. So 17 is a number of complete victory 
in Christ, right? So let's look at the seven stages of Jacob's life uh, and see what they teach us today about our life of faith. Okay, so let's look at number one. The first stage is fighting for the firstborn blessings, right? That's the blank there, firstborn. As we just saw, he was born fighting, right? Struggling. Okay, so as I said, there are two people in us, right? The fleshly person and the spiritual person. They're struggling in us, just like Esau and Jacob was. So if we trust in God's promises, it will happen so that the spiritual will win. However, it's not going to be an easy fight. We're going to have to go through a long process of struggling like Jacob did. Okay, So Jacob was completely just immersed in this desire to get the firstborn blessings. That was, that filled his mind. So remember that scene where Esau comes home after hunting, he was hungry. He says, give me some of that red stuff because I'm famished, right? He calls it the red stuff. That became his nickname, Edom, which means red, okay? So apparently Jacob was making some lentil stew, which was reddish in color. So Jacob immediately catches on to that opportunity and he says, okay, I'll give it to you if you sell me your birthright. See that? That's all he was thinking about. Even at that moment, that came to his mind. Give me that birthright. I'll give you the soup. So Esau being the fleshly person, what does he say? He says, what good is this birthright if I'm going to starve to death? Filling my belly is more important, right? That's the fleshly person. But... Do you think Esau would have died of hunger at that point right there if he didn't eat that stew? I mean, one meal is not going to kill you, right? So Esau, the Bible says, despised his birthright. So Esau sold his birthright for that bowl of red lentil stew. That red lentil stew reminds us of the blood of Christ, right? The blank there is blood. The red lentil stew reminds us of the blood of Christ that was used as payment to gain our salvation. Jacob used the red lentil stew as payment to get the birthright. Jesus used his blood to pay for the forgiveness of our sins and for our salvation. Now, after he got the birthright, next he has to get the firstborn blessings. When the father is about to die, it was traditional that the father give the firstborn double full, twofold blessings. So now Jacob wanted to get that. So in Genesis chapter 27, verse 19, it says, Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. See, he lied here. I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Get up, please. Sit and eat of my game that you may bless me. So it's... Isaac, at this point, was old. He couldn't see very well. So he told Esau, look, it might be that I might die soon, so I'm going to bless you. Go hunt some game for me and come back so I could bless you. And Jacob heard this. So what did he do? His mother gave him Esau's clothing and took a goat and cooked it. But he took the, the, she took the skin of the goat and put it on Jacob's arms on, and on the back of his neck. Because Esau was hairy, but Jacob wasn't. Okay? So he went in like this, with his brother's clothing, with this hair on his body, to make himself feel like his brother. So when he went in, Isaac ate the food that he brought in and blessed Jacob as the firstborn. So what does this teach us? Now, outwardly, this thing that Jacob did was deceitful. It was a sin. It was wrong. However, spiritually, there is a lesson here for us today. And that is this. It's teaching us that none of us have the right to receive the firstborn blessing. As fallen, sinful human beings, none of us have any merit to gain this birthright, the firstborn blessings. So, What do we need to do? We need to put on the clothing and the appearance of the true firstborn. And who is that? 
That's Jesus Christ. Just as Jacob put on Esau's clothing and made himself feel hairy like his own brother, we have to put on Jesus Christ to receive our firstborn blessings. So in Romans 13, verse 14, it says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. So besides the fact that Jacob desired the firstborn blessings, there was nothing else in him that deserved this firstborn blessings. And that teaches us about ourselves. The fact that we're here today reveals that we have this desire like Jacob too. However, there is nothing else in us that merits the firstborn blessings because we're all sinners. It is through the grace of Jesus Christ. Jesus has to cover us for us to be able to receive this blessing. So Jacob got the blessing and Esau found this out and Esau wanted to kill him, right? So Rebecca sends Jacob away to her own hometown, Padan Aram, to her brother Laban's house. So that begins the second stage in Jacob's life. Second stage is the covenant of Bethel and hardships in Padan Aram. So he ran away, Jacob ran away. On the first night, he stays at a place called Luz, which he later renames as Bethel. Okay? And there, when he fell asleep, he had a dream about a ladder, right? He dreamt that a ladder was touching heaven and earth. And there were angels ascending and descending this ladder, right? So in Genesis 28, 12, it says, He had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. So this ladder foreshadows Jesus Christ. Why do we say that? Because this ladder connects heaven and earth, right? Right? It started from the earth, but it touched heaven. And not only that, in John chapter 1, verse 51, Jesus himself says, and he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. See that? Here, the angels of God were ascending and descending on the ladder, right? But here in the New Testament, Jesus says, the angels of God will ascend and descend on the Son of Man, Jesus himself. Thereby, Jesus is saying, I'm this ladder that was in Jacob's dream. In other words, Jesus is the only mediator that connects heaven and earth. That's why we need him. Okay? So here, God appeared to him, uh, appeared to Jacob, and made a covenant with him. Okay? And the promises that God gave to Jacob were basically the same promise that he gave to Abraham. He said, you're going to have many descendants, and you're going to come back here and take possession of this land. And then God added one more thing. In Genesis 28, 15, it says, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So God makes this one more promise to Jacob, which is that he, God, will be with him wherever he goes until he brings him back to this land and fulfills all the promises of God. So this basically is Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? It means God with us, right? That's the promise that God is making here. I'm going to be with you until you come back here and all of my promises are fulfilled in you. So this promise is still abiding today for those of us who are children of Abraham, right? That God will be with us and he will fulfill the promises. This reveals again Jesus' promise to all of his disciples, right? In Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, As Jesus ascended to heaven, what did he say? He said, I will be with you until the end of the ages. Okay? So one of the reasons why Jesus appeared in the flesh is to show us that God is with us, to prove as evidence, look, I'm here with you. And even when he left and we can't see him anymore, he's reminding us, 
I came to show you that I am there with you, right? So Jacob went to Laban's house and suffered much during the 20 years because his uncle Laban was really a bad person, right? So Laban foreshadows the Antichrist. He tricked him out of all of his you know, wages and things like that. However, God still restored everything to Jacob. And at the end of the 20 years, he became wealthy. He had four wives and 11 children. And when the 20 years were fulfilled, God told him to go back to the land of Canaan. So that begins the third stage of Jacob's life. Purchase of Shechem and trials in Shechem. So on the way back home to Canaan, Jacob heard that his brother Esau was coming to kill him. So Jacob got very afraid. So he sent many gifts ahead of him to give to Esau. He sent his children and his wives ahead of him. And then he was left alone at the fords of Jabbok. And all through the night, the Bible says, a man appeared and wrestled with Jacob. Okay? And that, we know, is Peniel, right? Peniel. So in Genesis chapter 32, verses 26 through 28, this is what Jacob says. Then he said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. Or this is what the man said, right? But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. So this is where Jacob receives the new name Israel, which means you have striven with God and with man and have prevailed. Okay? So we see that here, Jacob is basically saying from the beginning, he has one thing in mind at all times. What is that? Blessings. He just wants God's blessing. Okay? So that one thing is good about Jacob, that he is seeking God's blessing. And so finally, he won't let go. So God says, okay, I will acknowledge that you have won. And he gave him this new name, right? Israel, which means that he has striven with God and men and have prevailed. So when we submit ourselves to the will of God, that is when God blesses us with this new name of Israel. So here Jacob met the incarnate God. What does incarnate means? mean? It means in the flesh, right? Jacob met God in the flesh. And that's Jesus Christ. So that's why Jacob named the place Peniel. The blank there is Peniel. And Peniel means literally the face of God. Okay, the face of God. It's because he saw God face to face and did not die. So Jacob receives this new name. He becomes a new person, Israel. And finally, he comes back to the land of Canaan and purchases the land in Shechem, and he lived there for about 10 years, but something bad happens there. His daughter, Dinah, gets raped in Shechem, and his two sons, Simeon and Levi, take revenge upon uh, their sister by telling the Shechemites to get circumcised. Unless they, can't, uh, unless they do that, they can't marry with the Israelites. So when they were circumcised and in pain, they came and killed all of the men. So because of that, Jacob is now very afraid. He thinks that the people of Shechem are going to try to kill their entire family. So he prays to God. And God tells them to go back to Bethel and live there. So that begins the fourth stage in Jacob's life. Reconfirmation of the covenant at Bethel. See, Jacob had forgotten about the vow that he made at Bethel. He said, God, if you are with me, if you enable me to come back here safely, then you will be my God. I will serve you as my God. I'll give you a tithe, a tenth of everything I earn. And I will come back here to worship you. That was his vow. But he forgot about that. 
So he remained in Shechem and did not go all the way to Bethel. So now through this incident, God makes him go back. So when he returned back to Bethel, this is what God said in Genesis 35 verses 9 through 10. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and he blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. Thus he called him Israel. This is basically a repetition of what happened at Peniel, right? So why does God do this? He already gave him the name Israel, but he's giving it to him again as if this is the first time. So basically what God is saying here is that because he forgot his vow and did not return all the way to Bethel, he did not fulfill, Jacob did not fulfill his part. So finally when he came back to Bethel, now God is saying, okay, now you are really Israel. Now you have earned the firstborn blessing and rights. Now you are truly my firstborn. So Jacob started out at Bethel, went to Padan Aram for 20 years, and came back to Bethel. That finishes that circuit of his life, the first part of his life. So here, Jacob finally becomes the true firstborn Okay, at Bethel. And the name Bethel means house of God, right? So this brings to a close the first half of Jacob's life. Now begins the next stage. And in the second half of Jacob's life, the first part was what? He was just completely worried about how to get the firstborn blessings. That was his whole life. How am I going to get the firstborn blessings? And now he got it, right? So what's the next part of his life? The next part is now he's getting older and he's thinking, who's going to carry on this firstborn blessings and the firstborn covenant in the next generation? That's what's worrying, uh, making Jacob, that's what Jacob is thinking about in the next half of his life, right? So in the fifth stage, The fifth stage is the dark days after losing Joseph. After much contemplation and prayer, Jacob realized that it was Joseph who will carry on the covenant in the future. Out of the 12 sons that he had, Joseph was the most most faithful. So he showed that by making Joseph this multicolored tunic, right? And he loved Joseph more than the other brothers. And because of that, the other brothers envied Joseph. And so what do they do? They sold him as a slave into Egypt. And when Jacob hears this, he is completely broken, right? He, that was his firstborn who was going to carry on this blessing in the future generation. But he thought that Joseph was dead now. So you can imagine the pain he was feeling. And then, so in Genesis chapter 37, verses 3 and 4, he made a very colored tunic for Joseph. And because of that, his brothers hated him. And so they sold him. And then the the next stage, the sixth stage in Jacob's life, is the 17 years, the blank is 17, that he spends with Joseph in Egypt. Okay? So he thought Joseph was dead, right? And then years later, because there was a famine in the land, he sends his sons to Egypt because he hears that there's food in Egypt. And finally, they learn that Joseph is alive. Not only alive, but he's the prime minister of Egypt. And when Jacob hears this, he is very happy. So Jacob goes down to Egypt when he is 130 years old. Okay? When Jacob and his 70 family members went down to Egypt, he was 130 years old. And Jacob dies at 147. That's the blank there, 147. So you could do the math. That means he spent 17 years in Egypt. Egypt with Joseph. The last 17 years of his life were very happy because his son Joseph was alive, not only alive, but he was the prime minister of Egypt. 
So he was taken care of in Egypt, right? And then finally in Genesis 49, verse 33, it says, When Jacob finished charging his sons, he drew his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. So this is the scene of Jacob's death. In the History of Redemption series, book number two, it talks about this scene in, in depth, okay, it's extensively. And the author, Reverend Abraham Park, says, this is one of the most beautiful scenes of death in the Bible. It says he drew his feet into the bed and breathed his last. People didn't help him. He drew his feet into the bed and prepared himself to meet God. So the history of redemption says only those people who have fulfilled their God-given duty and calling in life can prepare for death like this. Jacob was not afraid. He was ready because he has fulfilled his duties in life. He earned the firstborn rights and the blessings and he passed it on to his son, Joseph, right? When he met him here in Egypt, he passed on that blessing to Joseph. He gave Joseph two full blessings by giving him the land of Shechem, one more piece than all of his brothers. And he told Joseph what to do, instructed him what to do in the future, right? That he has to be buried in Canaan, not in Egypt, foreshadowing that the Israelites will come out of Egypt and will come back to Canaan. So he has delivered all of that. He transmitted all of that to his son. He's finished all that work. And now he's ready to be called by God. Right? This is the the image of a person who has fulfilled God's duties and callings in his life. And finally, the last stage in Jacob's life is his funeral procession and burial. Just as their father's wish, Joseph and the brothers took Jacob's body and carried him in a procession all the way back to Canaan and buried him at Hebron at the cave of Machpelah where Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebekah, and Leah was buried there. So Jacob would be buried there next to Leah, right? Six people. Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebekah, Jacob, and Leah. All buried in the same cave, the cave of Machpelah at Hebron. That was Jacob's final wish. And Joseph and his brothers fulfilled that wish. They obeyed their father. So since Joseph was still prime minister of Egypt, they had like a royal funeral procession for his father. So like Egyptian army, soldiers, you know, ministers, all kinds of people followed. So there was this huge procession going from Egypt to Canaan. Now, uh, I'm sure that we have learned that if you look at the map uh, going from Egypt to Canaan, if you go straight through, it's very close, right? You go You go by the coastal route from Egypt to Canaan, it's very close. But they didn't go that way. They went around so that they came and had to cross the River Jordan to get back into Canaan. Okay, So so if Egypt is here and Canaan is here, and this is the Jordan River and this is the Dead Sea, right? They could just go straight in like this, but they didn't do that. They went around and came around like this and crossed the river here and went into Canaan and then went back down to Hebron, which is in the southern part. Doesn't make sense, right? This is the easier route and quicker route. But they went this way. Why? God told them to do this because this foreshadows the wilderness journey that the Israelites will have to go through in the future. Jacob represents Israel, right? His new name is Israel, right? His children will be called Israel. They will go this way. So Jacob's funeral procession went this way also. But just before they crossed the Jordan right here, they stopped. 
In Genesis chapter 50, verse 10, it says this, When they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, right, beyond, on the other side of the Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and sorrowful lamentation, and he observed seven days mourning for his father. Okay? So just before they crossed the Jordan, they stopped here at a place called the threshing floor of Atad, and they mourned for Jacob for seven days. So why did they do this? What is a threshing floor? Threshing floor basically is a very wide open, flat outdoor area, usually on a hill somewhere high up that's open all around. They, when they harvest, they bring all of their grain to the threshing floor and they step on it to separate the wheat from the stalk and the chaff. And then they take that and they winnow it. Winnowing means you take this big pan-like thing and they put it all, put the grain in there and they toss it like this. And when you toss it, the wind's blowing, right? So the chaff, which is lighter, will be blown away the grain, which is heavier, will fall back into the pan. That's the winnowing process. Okay? They did that at the threshing floor. And Jesus likens that to judgment. Okay? So in Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, it says, His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. See that? The threshing floor is likened to the place of judgment of the end times. So the threshing floor symbolizes judgment. That's where the chaff and the wheat are separated. So when they came to this place called the threshing floor of Atad, they stopped and mourned for Jacob for seven days. Why did they do that? So, Atad in Hebrew means bramble or thorn bush. Okay, the blank is thorn bush. So from that name, we could guess that this threshing floor was a place where they brought you know, these trees that have thorns in it and took out the thorns, right? As well as the grain and the wheat. What is that teaching us? Thorns in the Bible first appear in Genesis 3.18 when Adam fell. When Adam fell, God said, now the ground will put forth thorns and thistles and you will have to work hard to be able to eat from it. So thorns are a direct result of the fall of Adam. So do you think God here is talking about actual physical thorns on trees and plants? I don't think so, right? Because when Jesus talked about the four types of grounds, he talked about the thorny ground also, right? That ground we learn symbolizes our hearts. So the thorns are the result of sin and fall. In other words, we all have thorns in us. All fallen human beings have thorns. That's why our words prick each other, right? Instead of talking nicely, we say things that will prick each other and it hurts us. We prick our beloved family members with our words, with our eyes, the way we look at each other. That's all thorns. Everybody has them. And this threshing floor of Atad is where the, those thorns are removed. So Atad, the threshing floor of Atad was near Peniel. That's the blank there. It was near Peniel. Okay. So let me draw that map again. If Canaan is here and the River Jordan and the Dead Sea is here, there's a little river out that comes out that's called Jabbok. And the fords of Jabbok is where Jacob wrestled with God, right? So it's somewhere around here. And the threshing floor of Atad, we will conjecture, is somewhere here. 
The Fords of Jabbok is like a canyon. It's a deep canyon, and it's probably very narrow. Okay? So not a lot of people could go down there. And when the funeral procession came, there was a lot of people with them. So the nearest place where they could accommodate all of those people was most likely this place called the threshing floor of Atad. That was near Peniel, where Jacob received his new name, Israel. That's where Jacob became a new person. The chaff that was in him, the thorns that was in him was removed by God, and he became Israel. That was the high point of his life. That's the, the most important event in Jacob's life. If you were to look back upon somebody's life and say, what's the most important event in his life? For Jacob, it would be here at Peniel. And Joseph knew this. So when they came here, they stopped. They commemorated jo Jacob's life by remembering what happened to him there. How he became Israel at this place. How God had removed the thorns from him. And then afterwards, he was able to reconcile with Esau. Jacob became a completely different person, right? Not only did they commemorate that, but I'm sure that while they were there, they were contemplating and reflecting upon that because they have to go through the same process. And after they came back from the funeral, Joseph forgave his brothers and he was reconciled with his brothers, right? He did not take vengeance upon them. So Joseph learned from his father's life. So the threshing floor of Atad is the most important thing that happened to Jacob at Peniel. Okay? So in Psalm 34, verse 18, it says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Jacob became a new person because he was crushed at Peniel. So sometimes we have to go through these hardships. That is necessary to remove the thorns that are in us. In Isaiah chapter 21, verse 10, it says, O my threshed people, and my afflicted of the threshing floor, what I have heard from the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I make known to you. See, the Israelites are called the afflicted of the threshing floor. That's what happened to Jacob, right? And he became Israel. So after being crushed and threshed, Jacob became Israel. So we also have to go through the same process. So today, our threshing floor is the church. The church is the threshing floor. This is where the chaff and the weed are separated. This is where the thorns are removed from us. Through much prayer, we could identify the chaff and the thorns that are in us, right? You have to be honest when you pray. You have to identify your own chaff and your thorns that are in you. And we need to try our best to remove them through word and prayer and through the discipline that God gives to us. So in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, it says, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. See, this is what we do during the season of Lent, right? Why do we fast? Why do we give up some of the things that we, don't, uh, we like during the season of Lent? Because by suffering, we are able to discipline ourselves and remove the chaff and the thorns that are in us. So in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. See that? As fallen human beings, we cannot overcome sin just very easily. Oh, yes, I read the Bible. I know it. But to apply what we have learned is a different thing. So Jacob's life shows us that life of a victory. His victory was not just over men, but with God. When he submitted himself to God so that God could fix him, God said, 
God acknowledged that now he is victorious. So his life shows us what our life needs to be like. And Jesus' life also shows us because he has taught us to follow in his footsteps. So during this season of Lent, I hope and pray that we will not be afraid of the disciplines that God brings to us, but may we accept it with faith and with thanksgiving, knowing that it's going to make us into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ, that it's going to turn us into Israel, the true firstborns of God. Amen? And I hope and pray that we will continue in this work and be faithful so that God will finish his work in our lives. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you for the work that you are doing in our lives. At times it may seem hard or painful, but help us to have faith to be able to overcome those things so that like Jacob, we may be given the new name of Israel and that we may be acknowledged as being victorious and that we may be received by you, Lord, as your firstborn. So we thank you for this process. We thank you for accepting us, even though we do not deserve any of this. And we thank you for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And at this time, because we are thankful, we want to give this offering to you, Lord. Please help us to give with a thankful and a cheerful heart. Help us to give with all of our hearts and by faith so that you may be pleased with this offering. And may this offering return back to us as even greater blessings in our lives. Please bless each and every hand that gives so that we may receive the blessing of wealth that comes without sorrows. We thank you so much, Lord, and we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's give glory to God with our applause.